Hey, it is Val the Voice Johnson, and it is Talk on Tuesday. We are kicking off October. Fabulous. Aren't we doing it? Aren't we doing it? Guys, I'm so grateful that you guys are here. Go ahead and say hello in the chat, in the chat, in the chat. Oh, my goodness. I see people are here. Hey, Janelle, good to see you. And I see Queen Lakeisha is here. How are you? Oh, goodness. And <laughs> Jay, is there a show tonight? Yes, there is. Uh, we, a lot of backstage talking happening. And I see <laughs> African Royale. That would be Ursula. My God, my Lord, today. <laughs> We're going to get started. We're going to get started. We're going to get started. I'm glad you guys are here joining us with another edition of Talk on Tuesdays. It's a special edition. It's a special edition. We have a special guest in the building. and We'll bring them on just after this. Here we go. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm looking at something and something has changed. I'm trying to figure out what happened. Okay. <laughs> anyway, guys, I'm glad you guys have joined us here. I am so grateful that you all are here in the building. Go ahead and say hello in the chat as I go ahead and make some changes. I don't know what happened, but it's all good. It's all good in the hood like it should. And a, an NBA legend is coming and a Chicago native. Very, very excited about this particular talk on Tuesdays. I don't know what you all did over the weekend, but go ahead and chat among yourselves. I've definitely been having a lot of fun doing my after shows on Clubhouse, and that has been fabulous to be able to do. But guys, we are coming, and we're coming live, live from the shy. Well, I'm coming live from the shy, and we're going to be getting it going in three, two, one. Here we go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love technology. It makes me a stronger woman in every sense of the word. Yes, it does. <laughs> Val, what's going on? I don't know. Here we go. <laughs> Live and grateful that you all are joining us here in the building, in the building, in the building. Of course, we got to let you guys know this particular episode is brought to you by our affiliate sponsor. It is Legal Shield. If you need a will or trust prepared or updated, or if you're worried about identity theft and have a business you need to protect or trademark, learn how Legal Shield can help represent you and your legal needs at a fraction of the cost. Uh, please visit the website linktr.ee forward slash pure light media for more information and go ahead and text to 347 652 0243 the word legal if you want to go ahead and get some help. <laughs> and then, of course, if you're interested in starting your own platform or become a fan of the Interludes platform, join us on Patreon, and I'll ask Mr. Springer to place that in the chat. Become a fan or a member of our podcasting community today. <sighs> wow, wow, wow. Well, we're going to do this early, early, early. It's time to bring him on. Here he comes. <laughs> I have the voice. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> hey, I got, I got, I got to take my hats off to you. That new intro is hot, man. That's hot. Oh my goodness, that's hot. <laughs> I'm like, you know, that's Fourth of July downtown Navy Pier hot. 
Oh, let me let me see what the let me see what's happening. Oh, this is Jay saying, "Love your voice, Val. Definitely sounds like a radio DJ or host. Thank you so very much. Hey, Daniel, great to see you. Oh my goodness, hey, you guys Smith, thank you. What's happening, baby? And I got my boy Joe Fazio in the house tonight too from Memphis, Val. Appreciate him coming in. Ooh, you know, hey, they, they, they 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 just talked us a couple of weeks ago with Notre Dame versus Tennessee State, but it's all good. And then of course we got. Our boy e. in the building. E. There you go. Oh, shot town in the building tonight, E. Oh my gosh. Well, we have a special guest in the in the building in the building. Coach. Oh, man. oh let me oh, tell you something. You know, to you. Let me tell you something. We we always have great guests. You know what I'm saying? We just came off Coach Tarver. And the cool thing about that, you know, we got we spoke to her. She was on CNN. We've had I saw that. Like, did you see that? That was awesome. Yeah. And, then, and mm -hmm. then she mentioned us on CNN, which was even better, said she because we were the first show that allowed her her team to get on, you know, and express themselves, uh, you know, which is which is just ridiculous. I mean, we we've had so many guests, but tonight to keep this straight shot town, south side, the three of us like a triangle. Oh, let me tell you something, Val. We got Chicago Rays. Argyle Garden, Deep South Side, May, Carver High School, DePaul University, All American, two time All Star NBA, two time All NBA team, All Rookie team in 82 83, and Rookie of the Year. And by the way, for y'all that don't know, when Jordan got in the lead, this guy blocked his shot, just to let y'all know off the rip. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring in one of the guys my idol that I love, been to his camps and all that. Put your hands together. But before we bring him on, make before sure we bring him on. Yes. We bring him on, you are listening to the hot show that's coming right now nationwide on Inner Loose Talk on Tuesday. So please like this show. Push that like button. And then make sure if you have not subscribed, subscribe to this show because we're going to keep bringing you material like this. Now, mm -hmm. let's yeah, get that call so let's do this. Let's see a little bit about our guest. And here is a surprise singer of the national anthem, all-star forward Terry Cummings, who was an ordained minister and also has done a lot of gospel singing and has recorded an album. And here he is with the national anthem. He knew what he was going to be. Yeah. That was kind of a given. 96, 95 Kings, Cummings. He wasn't out there, you know, like, okay, well, I'm going to hang out like this. None of that. He was focused on this game. For two for three. Cummings. Look at that banker. Thorpe. You know, Terry was a great big man in college as well as in the NBA. I got to stand up on this. So Terry stands up because he's not playing. And a big old circle right there goes, I'll kick you, I'll kick you, I'll kick you, and I'll kick you. Now, any one of y'all stand up right now for some playing time. That's what he said. And I was like, that's my guy. There was no arrogance. There was no, I'm, you know, I'm destined to leave here and go to the NBA. You know, I watched Terry play at DePaul. That's how far back. I've seen him or known of him. Who better to learn how to play this game than Terry Cummings? Terry was the first person that uh, uh, I connected with. He was the reason I came to the ball. He wasn't just there as a student athlete. He was there to uh, do what he could do uh, in the ministry. He has given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ while he was young. And the onus is on that person to make sure that they let the light shine wherever they may be. He is God's man. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. He is God's man. And if you are around him just long enough, I promise you something is going to drop off. The calling on his life was very serious. He had really mentally um, cut that part off did away with those memories. I didn't know exactly what was going on with Terry. I wasn't close to that situation. Obviously, these people loved and respected him. 
they did. And, um, you know, maybe they still wonder, well, what happened? TC, hey, hey, that's got to be introduction, baby. Hi. <laughs> 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 hey, welcome, you, welcome to Inner Little T. You know, thanks for having me. There's nothing you can say. You know, I, I am, you know, I'm real in my in my way. I'm shy to get to where I need to be to do what I, I need to do, but. I've never been comfortable hearing people talk about me. It is the most uncomfortable thing I think that happens in my world. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, you and you don't realize how many people, from kids to adults to whomever, lives that you've actually touched. Um, you know, and that's the amazing part about it. You know, and 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 this audience that we got tonight is a live show, so we coming from you know coast to coast. You know, tell tell the people a little bit, you know, just about your upbringing in the city of Chicago from one side of the city to the next. So they kind of get to know who you are. Yeah, I am um, one of 13. I've got uh, five above and seven underneath me uh, as far as siblings. And uh, we we grew up on the north side of Chicago, about six, seven blocks from uh, Cabrini Green. Um, and this is in the early days. Uh, we lived above a uh, a store called Spotlight at the time is all condoed out now, but we thought right. it was a house because we didn't know no better. Um, but we would bunk bed in, and you know, uh, two or three to a bunk bed, and then, you know, you do the best you can with everything. And man, uh, we moved to uh, the South Side of Chicago in '72, and uh, that's how I got to uh, Carver High School. Um, but it, you know, for me that that. It's been a natural progression growing up on the north side and learning, you know, one lifestyle. And then on the south side, it was something totally different. We were the first black family in that area where we lived in Roseland in 1972. We lived uh, on, on one side, there was a Jewish family. And on the other side, a biker gang lived. So we, we uh, I mean, you can't, I mean, you, you can't make that stuff up. It was really just like that. No. Hey, just like just like the neighborhood, you can't make it up in the most diversified city. And then where you were at with Carver, right down the street, you had Washington High School, which is a whole nother ball game. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a you know, there's a lot of things like I could tell you, Coach, um, uh, and Val, that I um I don't have stories like a lot of the cats that went to the five star to BC camps and all those yeah. things that regulated talent. Uh, for players, I only camp I went to was Athletes for Better Education with Forrest Harris. Um, exactly. So I I was a sleeper or what they call a blue chip. Nobody really knew who I was, but the people in the city that knew knew the game and knew I was getting around the city. You know, playing at different you know BBR Lower North. You know, which would you know be equal to uh, AAU now. You know, we travel to these other places on the west side, south side, north side, mm -hmm. and ball against them. And we would leave the the city and and go outside the state to find the best talent. At the times, right. you know, we played. I played with some cats I went to high school with. Um, we were the little brothers of the older brothers. The older brothers were the G man, and we were jazz the jazz back then. Right. And um. So we, we, you know, my, my, my real legacy, uh, as much as college is uh, a big part of it in um, the pro game, is what um, I was able to do on the street level. You know, playing ball on the street level wasn't all about the razzmatazz back then, even though everybody had it. You know, it was still about balling, you know, with some order to what your game was, because you had to be able to take that game and put it into a structured environment and play your game. You know, exactly. you can have all yeah. of that other stuff, but you got to be able to put it in some order, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, your brother Lee wasn't no joke either, though. I remember him. No, no. He <laughs> was actually he was actually a great player. Yeah. You know, he was a great player. And, and I can tell you this, that a lot of what I became was because um, 
I challenged him. He challenged me. You know, he he made it so I had a chip on my shoulder by the time I got to my junior year in high school and got to the uh, co collegiate level. I had a chip on my shoulder because I had an older brother that was beating the stew out of me every chance he got, literally, <laughs> until <laughs> until I started growing. Once I started growing, I'd always it been different. really strong. Yeah, it was over. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. It wasn't different. It was over. <laughs> so that, uh, I, I grew from like five eight uh, to six four over one summer. And when oh, I got really? back, I was staying with my grandparents in Hammond, Indiana. Okay. And when I got back to the city, I was head mm -hmm. and shoulders over everybody, including Lee. And um, oh, wow. and it wasn't just the height. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could imagine a little kid with a Tasmanian type mindset and who won't quit, who <laughs> won't give up, who will fight you even if you beat them down. Imagine that at five, eight, and then imagine it eight inches later, you know, right. and filling out, wow. you know. And uh, it was just a different thing. But my brother, uh, he and I had a conversation once because he he would have these moments where I think he would be a bit upset because I went and I really feel in many ways I lived his life because it was never um, my heart to to play the game. I played the game because he played it. And and right. I told him one in one of our conversations, I said, I think you just really don't get it. I said, because um, you're the reason why I play the game. You 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 drove me to this place. And fortunately for me, I was I've always been able to make get to a point where I would make my own choices. I did not follow people to follow them forever. I followed them till I got to where I knew where I was going. And then oh, wow. when I knew where I was going, you know, I made choices for myself. And I'm saying this at 62, but I was thinking this way at 16. Right. You know, and, yeah. and it wasn't and it wasn't necessarily a talk thing. I just knew I needed to go my direction. And one of the directions that you just went on a in, a in a very early part of your career, early part of your life, if I saw and read this correctly, that you became an ordained minister by age seventeen. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I'm assuming um, that I'm assuming Lee didn't. Uh, I'm assuming Lee didn't influence that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually, actually he did because he was the first one okay. in our immediate family that went into uh, ministry. He used to pull people off okay. the streets because he was a hard, hard nosed kind of cat. He would pull them off the street, take them into the basement and share Jesus with them. And, you know, people were, you know, lives were being changed and things like that. But he didn't he didn't hang in there with it. You know, during that oh. time, because Lee, Lee had a whole nother mindset for the streets and the girls and Shoot, I, I was a late bloomer in everything um, because I I learned real early that that you have to discipline yourself and focus on something long enough to be good at it. And you it, and my mom said this to me and I never forgot it when I was leaving college to go pro. She said to me, she said, Terry, don't worry about your friends. She said, you go and do what you're supposed to do and be who you're supposed to be, because when you come back, they'll be right here. And she ain't lying. <laughs> You right. know, you you each one of us have to make that choice um, for greatness. Greatness is not something that you're just born with. It is an idea initially, but that greatness comes to life when you step out and throw your line in the water and say, "Okay, I want some of that too," and I'm, I'm right. going to do what it takes to be that. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yes, speaking seventeen. Of ministry, mm -hmm. Speaking of that early ministry, you know, most of the time, especially in the black family. You know that is going to church every day of the week. You know what I mean? So, yeah, all eight, all eight, of, all eight days. My, 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 my mom used to send me to Alabama, and I, and I said, "Hey, I got to Alabama, and every week we was in church. I'm in Bible school, Sunday school, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, and we, and the only time we thought we was having fun was Sunday night at the skate room. You know, uh -huh. but if you didn't go to church." You weren't going to the skate where you don't even don't even look toward that direction at all. So what? looking at that for you, and what a lot of people don't understand, that's on the podcast. You we're talking about Roseland, which ended up being one of the roughest neighborhoods, and you were a little further south than that. You know, mm -hmm. there were some things that 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 kind of stood in the way of you on that ministry at first. You know, how difficult was it to fight off the lures and the temptations? running with your brother, because you know how that is when you're young, you want to go with your older brothers out, 
and you got the stuff that's going on in the streets. You see the dead bodies, the guns, the drugs. How hard was that to fight off that at that situation and stay focused on where you knew you had to be? Well, for me, it wasn't that hard because ain't no nice way to say this. We grew into men quicker then than they do now. So right. things that we would experience back then, you know, by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I had been through the drug thing. I, you know, was carrying a gun and a knife. You know, I was drinking and smoking. And by the time I became a believer at 16, that was it for me. And one of the things that really mattered to me, even before I made the change, was I was tired of seeing my brothers die. You know, guys getting, you know, a friend, really close friend who was out, you know, they were shooting crap. Some, and the guy got a little upset at him because he lost and stabbed him with a pencil he, and he bled out in the streets. I was seven years old, uh, yeah. separate situation, seven, eight years old when I saw my first man killed. So I was growing up at a rapid age and I was forced to make decisions and choices um, right. so that I could, I, 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 I didn't even think I'd live to be 30 years old. And when I looked at sure. uh, the year 2000, um, when, when I was still a teenager, I was thinking that's the end of the world. You know, two th the year 2000 mm -hmm. is the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm not going to make it that, but I got to find a way to, to live my life, you know, in this, in this place, in this season, so that I, I can give a, a, a really good account of it when the time comes, you know, cause, uh, yeah. and to say that I, I was not afraid, it would be, be lying because there were things happening. And in the streets, y'all know, if you've been there, everything happens really quick. It ain't, exactly. it ain't even thought out. It just happens really quick. And before you know it, people are laying there. I, I've seen so much stuff that over the years I would share with the young people because they sometimes think that we, we were not touched by these things, but exactly. we chose a different route and a different path after the fact. Exactly. And we had those guys, you know, you and I talked earlier, you know, and uh, we had, you know, as they say, real gangsters back in the day. Guys <laughs> that, you know, I, I just talked to one of my kids earlier tonight. I, I, I would be at Morgan Park playing, you know, at the, you know, at the, uh, at the goals in the back of the school right there for the police department on 111. And mm -hmm. you see guys come up smoke weed and drink a 40 and get on the court and kill you, drop 30, you know? Yeah, like when, and yeah. Two minutes later, he in the front of the school on 111 gangbanging. So, you know, it was incredible. And, you know, as you and I was mentioning earlier, there there is no more Cabrini Green. There is no more Icky. There ain't no more Low End. You know, you know, and, and most of Roseland has closed up in what it is. But these were tough areas in Chicago. And the crazy mm -hmm. part about it, on these were the areas that if you wanted to get your name known to play ball, you had to go, even down yeah. in Foster Park. Yeah, you had to, yeah. Yeah, you had to make that trip. Yeah, let you me, had to make that let trip. Me, let me see. Oh, I the think Terry must have got a phone call. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> one of the, the, the things that uh, made life a lot simpler for me is I grew up in the house with a gangster. And I think a lot of us did. Our fathers were the first gangsters we knew. I mean, because yeah. they, okay. they, uh, and then we can say what we want to. My dad was a street Negro, you know, tired, fighting dude, and, you know, real quick tempered. The first gangster I ever knew was him, you know, and right. when, so whatever, <laughs> whatever he said was law, you know, right. and, and, and uh, I mean, that was all of us as tough as we thought we was. We all bowed down to him. You know, but I think that that's missing today because those fathers don't exist as much as they did in, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, there were men that were willing to father their sons and mentor their sons into manhood and take take the heat for uh, from your own children, which you have to be able to do even now when they complain that you didn't give them everything they needed or wanted, but you gave them the best you had to give. And that exactly. holds true with everybody. I mean, you see it all the time. Children complaining, you know, dad didn't do this. Mom didn't do that. But hey, I learned this from my own dad. My dad uh, was a, a, a physically abusive man because what they call a whooping today don't even add up. It, don't, it ain't even on the guy. It ain't on the they call DCFS. <laughs> they call DCFS. They, 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 
Hey, T, they get PlayStations after they whooping. What you talk about? <laughs> I know. We got a question in the audience here from our moderator in Brooklyn, uh, Mr. Springer. He says, what are your thoughts on mentorship and how it has impacted your career? I guess Terry's making some adjustments there. All right. He's getting texts right now. That's probably what's happening. <laughs> They're blowing up his phone right now. Yeah, yeah that's what it is, too. Like, yeah. Ooh, are you on? Are you live? Yes, I'm using my phone. <laughs> yeah, get up on me. <laughs> well, yeah, and I promise I'm technologically logical. I mean, in 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 I'm on with it, but I just... I, I couldn't get my laptop or my iPad Pro to connect, so I just went straight in with the phone. I apologize. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, we had a question on the table, you know, that was uh, just somebody was asking about what were your thoughts on, you know, mentorship and how it impacted your career uh, via from high school to college to the pros. I had some great men in my life that were not always men of notoriety. Uh, men who had great names or or anything, but they were great fathers and great husbands, uh, and and they um, they were the best, you know, uh, for me and for my my generation of cats that grew up together, um, um, like um, Horace Howard, who was the coach at Carver High School, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then. Um, of course, uh, Mr. Bailey, you all wouldn't know, but he, like I said, he, he was a Muslim. And I make a point of this to say that he's a Muslim, but he was a great black man to me too, uh, because mm -hmm. what he instilled in us as, as ball players and as, as young men was the, the idea, the ideology that we could be more, we could do more, and he didn't have to press it or, or impress us to believe that. We saw it in the way he handled us, you know, and how he was always there. We were all loading up in his El Dorado, the big, the old, big old one, and uh, <laughs> loading up and, with yeah, the phone, with the and phone riding, dogs, riding down the spot, <laughs> dipping down into the west side, the north side, yeah. east side, just going to play the best ballers. Because really, um, and this may be a little off, but I can tell you that a large part of my competitiveness and my ability to be that dominant kind of mindset player came because of people like Mr. Bailey and Horace Howard and Teddy Thomas and, and uh, at Carver High School, uh, Miss Sales, who taught me public speech. She was the hardest teacher I ever had, and she ain't but about five feet tall. She was giving me right. fits. That, that, that's usually the toughest one. Um, but she she said something to me and, and a couple of the other teachers that uh, shifted my mindset about everything I was doing and it helped me to understand how important it was for me to be um, a man of genuine integrity and character and it was uh, that you are not going to go out and represent us being a dumb n-word and that right. was at a time when there was a lot of us who couldn't really speak you know we were stutterers or we used a lot of this and that and duh and instead of you know speaking proper English uh, which now more than ever, you you hear a lot of guys speak now. They didn't. We we didn't have as many speak as well in the seventies and eighties. Exactly. You know, and it's it speaks to the mentorship, uh, which was the question, um, and it speaks also to the leadership. You know, even oh, if they don't, even if they don't know us, this whole platform exists because of men and women that went before them that laid down a strong foundation. And our teachers, you know, you know, you just give it up to the teachers. Uh, and Val, I don't know if you know that. Terry, I don't even know if you know this, but do you know that, you know, looking at all the great Illinois ball players and just bringing it down just to Carver, you know, you ranked in the top 10 right now, man. You know, Cassie Russell, number two. Uh -huh. which we all know about Cassie. Cassie, if you don't know Cassie, then you better do your homework. And yeah. Terry, you are number eight. Then, of course, you know my guy, Morgan Park, Mr. Levi Cobbs, brother mm -hmm. Levi down to Orlando, you know, went down to Europe. And then, of all people, you know, Hardaway ended up at 25. Now, the funny part about that is, you know, you guys used to be hard over there at Carver, man, because I never get it. We came to play Tim them at, at, at Carver one day. 
and Kenny Kenny Miller was on, with, with me, my post guy, with jumping ball. I don't even think the game even started yet, Terry. And Wade Jenkins looked next to me and said, hey, man, you know who that is? I go, yeah, that's Tim. What about it? He said, man, the first time you file him, I'm going to knock your ass out. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> the game is, what? And, and I'm going to you, tell you, because it was Chicago in the 80s, all the games were late afternoon because of game violence. We didn't play it. Oh, night. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah we didn't. The, no the three fifteen, three fifteen start, three fifteen start. 315, exactly, and we played before uh -huh. the girls. That's how uh -huh. Chicago ball was. Right out the school, you better be in that gym because it's gonna get loud. And you know, oh, yeah. and it was just, it was just, just nuts. But where I used to love to see you excel, man, you got to tell this story. I never forget in the hot box, not the new gym, but the hot box over at Chicago State in the pro am tournament. You came down there, and I think this is – I don't know how old. You had to probably be probably late high school, get ready to go in, maybe right as you got into pros. But Jordan was playing – so Jordan was playing, so you probably was your second, third year in the league. And uh -huh. Jordan was killing somebody, and he did a 360, and everybody went nuts. And I think you talked to somebody on a timeout, and the next play, you put Mike on the wall. Like, boom, that, you know, and everybody's like, oh, man, Terry put Mike on the ground. Man, what, what was that like to be in that situation and knowing you got this rookie in Georgia, everybody looked up at it, man, and you just wasn't fearful, but you was there to play ball? I mean, I, I can only say it like this, Coach, as good or great as Mike was, because we wound up playing together about seven or eight years in the summer league on the Playboy team. Um, okay. As, as good as, as the Playboy he, team he was. Right? Yeah. So, the, so the, as good as he was, playing street basketball, I ran into a lot of Michael Jordans. My brother yeah. was a smaller version of him. He didn't play defense like him, but if he decided he wanted to, he could shut people down. You know, but I, I played on the you know that Sandlot game with cats. A whole lot of cats people will never know their names, but it was some some yeah. cats I played with uh, and played against. They tested me. And, 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 and in the yeah. end, that's that stuff, yeah. you know, that's a part of the game, I think, that young guys and young girls miss now because they don't play sure. that. Like, I played all year round. All and I played all year round just to make sure I kept myself, you know, tight enough so that when camp came up, it, would, it wouldn't take me half the year to get in shape, game shape. It took me about yeah. two to three weeks because I was playing and working out all year round. And uh, these cats, uh, I think somebody just threw a question up what about the difference uh, oh, uh, yeah, between. Was, yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the differences is that there are just too many things to occupy their minds. Now, we just didn't have all that. You know, we didn't have, you know, I did. I shot commercials and 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 did things like that and traveled around the world and did all that stuff. But it didn't affect my mindset. I knew what my job was. I knew where my money came from, and I knew that this was about taking care of my whole family, not just the wife and kids, but my mom and dad, you know, and, and to be on point and in position if the family ever came under attack and needed legal help or hospital help or something. Uh, th that is like, to me, one of the things I think is missing in our uh, young people as a whole is understanding how valuable or, or, or um, invaluable they are to the community. You know, when right. you when you make it, it's it's no wonder that everybody grabs a piece of you and claims you as their own because you're doing something they would love to be able to do. But you do it really well and get paid for it. Exactly. And so you, you, you learn to live your life accordingly. You know, it doesn't happen with everybody because, like, you know, some people just feel like they don't they don't want to be nobody's role model. And it doesn't really matter what you want. You're you're in a position where being a role model comes with the position what you really the real the real decision to make well the real decision to make is is whether how much integrity or character you're going to walk within walk within it while you're doing it you know and and terry i got a great question here from eric uh, who who asked you who is the toughest player you face at any level and I, I, I get asked that a lot because, yeah. and, I, and I always answer it the same way. Now, Kevin McHale defended me probably better than anybody. He was long, 
And and normally when we would play Boston, they put Parrish on me. I'd beat him going to the basket. McHale is back there. They put McHale on me. I'd beat him. And then Parrish was back there. But they were <laughs> always, you know, challenge. they challenged my, my in-between game, my low post game. So I'd just take them out on the floor and um, drive past them as often as I could. But Kevin McHale was the one that was the toughest as a defender. Uh, physically, he wasn't. It was just his length. Uh, and he had enough quickness to challenge me. But uh, physical strength, it was players uh, equal uh, to my strength, maybe stronger, maybe not. Um, Oakley, uh, Buck Williams, a cat named Mike Williams that played in the league for years. These, these are guys that could match me on certain levels, but I always thought that real players have an A, B, C, D, E game. They have an alphabet game. If you take away from me, um, because we're equal in strength, uh, my low post game, then I take you outside. If you're quick enough to move with me outside, then I, I my third, my C game is to beat you up and down the court and get easy baskets. Early <laughs> offense, I make my living doing that. Um, in, in, in my D game is, is if you're good at all of those, those three things, I'm going to put you in the pick and roll and get some mismatch. <laughs> you know, so my, my mindset is was always thinking, you know, I don't have to be stopped. I just have to keep expanding my mindset about how I can get my game going. Because I don't think you can get on the pro level to score uh, almost 20,000 points um, just by being a jump shooter or a low post player. You have to um, always give yourself the advantage. You, you got to be, and the only way you can really do it, coach, is you have to be honest with yourself about who you're playing against. Uh, you're you playing go. against certain players, you know that they're going to make you work harder than you need to work in that game. So you may have to concede a part of that game to let another part be exposed. You know, exactly. if I exactly. if I can't it's score, true. I got to crash them boards. Yeah, if I can't exactly. if if I can't score, I got to crash them boards. I got to I got to out hustle them from end to end to get easy buckets. You know, hey, do, do the dirty work, do the stuff that people don't want. And the funny, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you talked about that because. As me coaching 23 years on the sideline and trying to make my players understand that, and one of my guys just asked a question a moment ago, and I was just being his son earlier tonight, and I was telling him about you. You know, you was at Mr. Dirty. We're going to rewind the tape before we even get, Val. That was a great quote before, before we even get to the NBA to show you how Terry stacked it up. He came from a loaded, uh, when I say loaded, I mean a loaded DePaul University team. I'm talking mm -hmm. about not only was it loaded. People always talk about New York and L.A. You don't understand, basketball in Chicago, early 80s, man, I put all my boys up against anybody in the country at that time. You know, yeah. and, when, and not only was DePaul loaded, but me and Terry were talking earlier, them uniforms was off the charts. I didn't know about mm -hmm. the pattern method, too, until you told me today. But yeah, that was the thing. The <laughs> and we, and, and the, the patent leathers were uh, something that I believe Mark, Mark came up with, but it was something we only wore in nationally televised games, and it set the uniforms off, you know. And it, it was, it was, uh, uh and in fact, um, we were sponsored by Adidas back then, and uh, yeah. Adidas would make those shoes especially for us, really. Yeah, oh man, that, 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 that. Oh, and, 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 and I would love to see on the hill. I think y'all had the demon logo with the demons on the back of the hill, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's now. And now, yeah. Val, you got to think of this team: Mark Aguirre, okay. Skip Money Diller, okay. yeah, um, Teddy Grubbs. You had um, who else am I missing now? Here, yeah, yeah, Bernard Randolph. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, man, yeah. they were loaded. Clyde Bradshaw. Remember Clyde? Clyde Bradshaw. And, and he Clyde was the free. Glad. Clyde the Glad, baby. You know, and we talking about Chicago's finest at DePaul with Coach Ray Meyer and DePaul at my at, at, at one point had the city on the route and until, you know, unfortunately he passed away and, you know, he moved it on the world. Before he passed, he moved it to his son, Joey, and then the program kind of started losing a little bit, even though we still did get Kenny Patterson and Ron Strickland and a couple guys that came on, a little bit David Booth, a couple guys that came on after that. But DePaul uh, was, a, was a powerhouse in the cities. I think that entire 80s, DePaul had a solid name, yeah. you know, and whatnot. What, he, he, I remember you played 
you guys played, we talked about earlier, you guys played against Louisville at that time against Never Nervous and beat them at that time. And as loaded as you guys were, what do you think was the one thing that kept you guys from winning the national championship? Hmm. Um, it, you know, when you're that gifted and talented a team, like we, I always thought we were a pro team on a college level. And yes. um, when we got to the tournament, we had to play college ball. And and then in, in the tournament back then, you couldn't you you couldn't um, allow for the most minutest of uh, of changes because it shifted everything. And each wow. year that I was at DePaul, it was something really small. Somebody always somebody stepping up uh, out of character and 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 uh -oh. doing things that caused because you know in, in the tournament. We played teams knew they didn't have a chance, so they held the ball for 30 seconds, yeah. you know, yeah. and ran a play. And we weren't disciplined enough as a whole um, to to not just come down and jack it up. Because when we would go down, jack it up, and miss, they bring it right back, run 30 seconds, passing that thing around the horn, and the last 10 to 15 seconds, run a play, and 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 they didn't miss shots. Y'all yeah, was talking about the now we're talking about no three pointer, man. So you got to look at it. Terry played during the time period. That no three point. I don't mean to date myself, but the three pointers came in my senior year in '86. The three point mm -hmm. line came in that year, so Terry was scoring and playing at this particular time, and um, at this particular time as well. About that, uh, Terry. Remember, we playing on rectangle backboards. Remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you yeah, could. We, we weren't playing on square backboard, Val. We didn't have all that glass. We Chicago played on. Rectangle backboard, not many with breakaways, yeah. and no three point line. And the, before it, it you really mess with your peripheral, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. Val. Yeah, and just to bef before you got into DePaul, walk me through how you got in because I think me and you talked about how you got into DePaul, which was a little different than most. You'd said a little bit earlier that people uh, that people weren't checking for uh, blue collar players like yourself yeah, yeah. get but oh yeah. my kids listen to what he's about to say i hope they got their ears tied to this have your ears on for the young people yes yeah well <laughs> i was i was being recruited by every major college that that mm -hmm. pretty much knew about me and as i said i was a late bloomer but i i'd gone and visited the university of iowa and lute olson was there and i was on my way to uh unlv with tarp to visit TARP. there and while i was thinking and, and deciding on the Vegas trip, I called and, and asked the Paul, I said, well, why aren't you all recruiting? I haven't gotten a call from you. I'd like to um, know more about your, you know, university. And they said, well, we've been trying. Your coach won't let us through. So <laughs> I made a call and went down there and set up a meeting with Ray Meyer, sat in the office for hours right. chatting with him. And then I told him at the end of the talk, I'm coming here. And, right. and you know what the other irony was about this that I hardly ever share? is my mother mm -hmm. and my father and not even my siblings were part of the decision making because again we were men already back then we yeah. we were already men in our decision making and and choice making i knew back then whatever choice i make i got to live with it i can't shift and change cuz i don't like the circumstances of what's going on cuz once once i've chosen it and me, you know, being a praying kind of dude and listening for the peace that comes from knowing what choice or decision to make. It was it was a not a complicated thing. You know, by the time I'm uh, uh, 18 years old to decide where I want to go. And they told me, though, when I got there, you you this ain't going to be your team. You're going to have to wait. <laughs> you, yeah, this is Mark's team, Mark McGuire's team. And uh, you just you're going to be a role player. But see, being a role player made me even more a scrapper because I knew that if I wanted to be in the scorebooks, if I wanted to be a part of the game, I had to do everything nobody else wanted to do, especially among the elite players on the team. So I played um, every practice like it was a game and every game like it was that same practice. And so everything right. carried over. And I didn't get plays run for me for two years, um, but I averaged in double digits, rebounds, and scoring on the basis of just outworking people. So that by the time I became the man in that game you're talking about in Louisville, you know, I was just stepping into what I was already doing because I had been balling out in the pro-am since I was 17 years old. I was playing against pros since I was 17. When I got to, to high school, I knew nobody could stick me. 
I knew they couldn't yeah. play me on the level of what I was used to. And then I got to college, I had to tone it down to play a role. And um, But I learned a lot from being a role player because it teaches you what they're going through. And it teaches you, you know, to, to manage yourself because you're not, you know, you're not as great as you think you are because at any point in time, a starter can become a, a bench player and he has to become a great role player. You know, if he's going to stay on the team, if he's going to be a part of the team. And I learned it in the NBA when I tore my, my ACL up and actually tore it up out at Ada Park playing ball out there. At Ada? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ada Look, Park, the young cat fell question. into my leg. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And the funny part about it is that that time before then, that Louisville game put you on the map big time. You know, they yeah. knew who you were. That Louisville game. That, that that game put you on the map at that time, big time, and your name was buzzing. Yeah, but the only people that really weren't aware were the people on national television because yeah. they had watched me progressively grow at DePaul uh, those two years prior to just playing a role, being a role player, you know, coming in uh, when it was time for me to take over a game, I could do it back then, you know, as a freshman or a sophomore, but they put me on the strongest and the biggest guy every game. Which which guarantees you something because I was only like six nine. I was six nine, but I was about two hundred pounds with two percent body fat, strong as an ox, <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, and couldn't couldn't get my weight to stay consistent or constant until they they had a little raggedy weight room, and I started visiting that weight room every day, and 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 I went from two hundred to about two thirty real quick. And and uh, yeah. and I made sure that it was you know it wasn't about bulk it was about flexibility so and uh, for those out there who, who don't know the difference bulk will make you look like Hulk but flexibility Correct. will give you you know the the Iron Man physique but allow you to be flexible enough to move around you and you don't affect your shot because that was the big yeah. thing back then that cats yeah. didn't want to lift because they felt like it'll it mess up their shot. Time. This mm -hmm. is they didn't know they go work out. I tell my guys the same thing. You got them bands now, work out, then go to the gym and put up shots. Once your body mm -hmm. gets used to a routine and everything, basic special basketball is muscle memory. Whether I'm, uh -huh. you know, I, I, whether I'm shooting a three or shooting a layup is muscle memory. You know, I tell you what, that was so amazing is that <clears throat> now you get yourself from DePaul, all American, get into the league and all that, and then you had. You know, you, 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 I don't even want to run down, but give these people, you know, a taste of the suitcase that you lived out of with the number of teams you got a chance to be with. Um, the first, uh, so you got drafted the to first, the Clippers, right? Yeah, but the first 10, 13 years, we were just, you know, two years with the Clippers, um, six years in total with Milwaukee, and then six years with, uh, San Antonio, and it wasn't really till I tore up my knee I became the journeyman. But okay. it, to me, uh, to me, they were the most exciting years of my whole career. I had more fun, and I felt more whole and complete as a role player than I ever did as a starter because I knew the game by then, I, and I was playing the whole game. I was they put me in the game at 39, 40 years old, running plays for me when the game was on the line. Or yeah. put me on the best offensive player on the floor when I'm 38 or 39, 40, and I'm stopping them because my focus right. had, had changed and I had become better, uh, a better player because I didn't have to just carry a team. I could be a role and play a role and let that be enough, you know, because you got they paying these other kids all this money, let them right. earn their money and just come in and plug. Got another phone call. It's popular. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. In a little talk on Tuesday, but that's what it'll do to you. <laughs> they plug you in. You know, and, and, Jace, all that. And, Jace, and Jay Smith says, TC and Pierce used to give my Detroit Peace, Pit Pistons the fits. And that was the the rugged Pistons at that time that they were with, 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 with Bill Lamb being the fools that would catch you come through the lane and put you down on the floor hard. You know, and that, that was that. You know, that was it. You, you, you still with his team? I am. Oh, he came back. Yeah, You're and, and popular. Bam, bam. <laughs> he, he, bam. Terry is trying to be real modest because he said 49. Now, now let, me, let me tell you something. At 52 <laughs> years old, played against Charlotte Hornet and Zoe and company, and Terry drops, I think, 
I think he was, I think he, uh, he thought what, 52 points mm -hmm. at that time, double, double, 11 rebounds, uh, some assists, and gave them the business. And that was later on in your career when you dropped that 52. I think you'd probably about in your, what, 37, 38, maybe? Well, the, um, I was still with the Spurs, so probably about 34, 35. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I got mad because that was during the time. Unfortunately, Mike's dad, you know, gets I mean, what happened to, to Mr. Jordan. Mike steps away and come back, and then, you know, we, we come off that 72-game winning streak with the Bulls, and then we have a gap, and then Mike comes back. We had two options. We had you, and we had Dennis Rodman. Mm -hmm. And the Bulls yeah. chose Dennis Rodman instead mm -hmm. of bringing you to Chicago to bring you back home. There's a story about, about that. Yeah, there's a story yeah, there about There that. has to be a story about that. Be a story. Uh, that well, see, they, they, called, they called me, their GM called me and told me they were interested in having me come there. Right, and um, and I was, I was kind of juiced, but then they started asking me a bunch of questions about Dennis because we had just played together for two years in San Antonio. And so right. uh, we were both coming from San Antonio. And um, so I said to them after they asked me a few questions, I said, oh, so you, you're not really interested in me. You want Dennis. I said, I'll give you all the information you need on me. He said, no, we want both of you. I said, that can't be possible. I said, because I'm not babysitting him. I saw what, what, what went down with him in San Antonio. I said, I can still play. I'm not an old dude. And I said, and I right. choose not to. And, and he said to me, he said, don't, don't you want to come through here and get, you can get a ring with Mike? I said, yeah. But I said, I ain't, they, ain't nobody ever gave me nothing. I said, I've worked for everything I've gotten in my whole life. And I just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be like everybody else and get in the line and get a ring and then move out. You know, if yeah. I were to come to Chicago, I'm coming to Chicago. I'm coming home. And I don't, yeah. I don't, you know, yeah. you know, I ain't going, I'm not going to be bought like that, you know, and, and, I, and I take that stance for myself because I have integrity and how I live and how I work and how I earn what I get. And I don't owe nobody none but loving them. You know, I ain't I ain't tripping on on the guys that went and did it, but that ain't my MO. So that's right. the reason why I didn't wind up. It wasn't them per se, but I didn't like mm -hmm. the way they came at me. Like that's, you know, that's what everybody right. wants is they want the ring. And I want the ring, but I want to mm -hmm. play and earn it. Right. And and here's the here's the thing. I cause I always hear about players that are from if they're from a city that they 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 grew up in, and I'm I'm always wondering, you know, wasn't if they had come to you in a different way, would you have ended up in Chicago? Like if they had come straight up and said, "No, we're just interested, and we want you. We don't care about Rodman." Because there's a part of me I don't know about you, Coach. I didn't want Rodman in with me because he was a Detroit Piston. I didn't want him. I didn't want him. <laughs> but, 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 but. But we caught the crazy Robin that Terry played with that would take his damn shoes off, sit on the bench, and start pouting because he didn't want to play in San Antonio and then jump on the floor. So they got to the point they were frustrated with him. So either he had to go or he was going to be out to leave. It was, it, that was a, you know, playing with Dennis. Dennis is, a, is, is not a bad guy. Let me That's say that. He, you know, he, he's a good guy. He just, I mean, I, I went through some things with him, so I already knew I wasn't going the next step, you know. Right. So playing with him in San Antonio, uh, Dennis did what he wanted, when he wanted, and how he wanted. You know, he he even, when he was uh, dating Madonna, he would bring Madonna in there while we were getting undressed, and we didn't even know it till one day I noticed <laughs> it looked like a little guy over in the corner all huddled what? up. And I look over there, and, it, and it's Madonna. I told him, y'all need to get her out of here. This ain't This ain't for her. You know, it's Joker's crazy. walking around butt naked, and and they know, and they don't care. Right. But that yeah. that ain't a good look for us, you know. No, it but it, it tells you too, because in during the two years I was playing with him, I don't think we had coaches that managed them. I think Phil Jackson and Mike you know, managed them better. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, in San Antonio, um, we had a meeting one day about him, and all the guys that complained about him didn't say one word. And so I looked at him. I said, you see him? I said, uh, this ain't his team. We we don't have to play with him. He has to play with us. But until you go. understand that, we ain't going to be a team. You know, and so we wow. wound up losing that year in the playoffs to Utah. But And I don't think we had the best coach. And I'm, I'm, wow. not, I'm not the one going to spit, 
you know, fire that was, on that somebody. Was, that, was, that, was, but, that, was, that was Jim Harris, right? Well, no. That was uh, John Lucas. And the oh, irony John behind Lucas. that is... Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, I forgot the about Coach Lucas. I totally forgot I, about Coach Lucas. I played with him in Milwaukee. Yeah. And then I played for him in San yeah. Antonio. And yeah. and I was at at the end I thought of my career. He treated me like that. And I was like, I remember them telling us after we lost to Utah and his job was in jeopardy. They they have these meetings the first week back from those those trips when the season is over. And uh mm-hmm. he one of the coaches called me and said, Well, Coach Luke wants you to come in on Monday. He wants to sit down, and talk to you about uh, your role and everything for the next year. I said, You tell Luke such and such and such. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, so don't, you don't tell call him, me. You tell him this for me. I was different back then. I was going through a divorce, yeah. too, and I, I didn't think things through all the time. I just said yeah. what I felt. I got you, yeah. Hey, whatever come off that tongue, that's what you're going to get hit with. You know what I'm he'll, be, he'll be waiting for me. <laughs> He's still waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> So I have to, I have to say, I have to say this throughout this entire time, you are still a minister. You're still uh-huh. walking in your Christian faith. Cause I'm just thinking you have seen some things that would test anyone's yeah. faith. <laughs> you played mm-hmm. with Rodman and could live to tell about it. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking, I'm just imagining. Hey, about hey, 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 that was, and that was, that, he, he, Terry talked about Madonna there. I remember and when he got to Chicago, Terry, he had uh, Carmen Electra. He used to come over to the limelight and kick it all the time. And he'll come uh-huh. out of the game. With Mike and Pippen, they, they wasn't following Mike and Pippen out of the game. They was following Rodman because they were trying to hang out with Carmen Electra. When we go to the limelight, Dennis be downtown, man, till like 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. They got a game the next day. Yeah, but, but he, <laughs> he was one of them cats. He was really different. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he's one of the first guys, and and I I give respect to the fact that he's a he he was a great player, but ultimately, the one thing that he brought to the game was just great rebounding, and and they in that era they tried to uh, glamorize it as more than what it was. He was a great rebounder. Yeah. That's what he was. Yeah. But the the yeah. off court stuff and all that persona made it seem bigger than life, but. We ain't win no games with Dennis playing, scoring 20, 30 points. You know, right. you know he, he didn't show up like that. If we need him, in fact, he's the most selfish, great rebounder you're going to probably hear, hear of. Because if you're playing, a, 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 I'm going to talk basketball, okay? Uh, right. So if you're playing defense and you got all five men on the string, and the ball is going around the horn, and everybody got to switch up, switch down, and switch out. Uh, if right. Dennis is the last man on the rotation, he won't go out to the shooter because yeah. he wants to rebound. So the, so the, corner, the corner ain't getting covered at yeah. all. Yeah, he's not going out to that shooter in the corner. He's going to stay in between that uh, three-point line, well, right right in the, uh, the blood the area, we call it. Yeah. yeah, he ain't going out there. He ain't running at him. He ain't gonna. He ain't gonna do nothing. He going because he's he wants to rebound. That's all he wants right. to do is rebound. You know. So he then, figured I get a shot up if it goes in or well, but if he misses, I'm gonna go get this ball. Yeah, and 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 Dennis can run all day and night. I remember uh, yeah. playing uh, in uh, San Antonio with him, and uh, we had a drill where we had to make a hundred, I think, layups, and they were wow. full court. So you, it was everybody involved. So it, it wasn't as long as it would have been with one or two people. It was the whole team. Everybody right. had to make the layup. Well, Dennis never got tired. He never got tired of running. So Dennis would, for a while, he'd make the layups. And then all of a sudden, he'd just throw it up there and, and, and it roll off. And he'd just keep running. And after we did that about once or twice, I grabbed that ball and threw it up in the upper deck. And when it sat down <laughs> on the sideline. <laughs> so oh, I had enough of this here, and they were all the coaches. Everybody would laugh. They called practice up. I was through. I was like, "That's it. <laughs> Wait a Y'all not gonna get- call this off. I'm done." <laughs> <laughs> and Jay Smith is calling Dennis the original junkyard dog. Oh my uh, god, yeah. so rough. He found the so original. Uh, I mean, he had to be, you know. And looking at today. Terry, you know, going back and look at your squads, you know, today I'm watching after you and I finished 
taking a look at today's NBA media day today and uh, looking at the trades and the moves and all that. What do you think about your old Milwaukee Bucks, you know, getting Dame Dollar, you know, with Giannis? And then you got Bradley Bill now going out to Phoenix to join with KD and uh, and Booker. And I, I don't like the fact, the matter that, that, that Milwaukee gave up Drew Holiday, even though Boston picks him up, you know, and whatnot. Um, and, and the funny part about it is the Lakers and Denver didn't really get anybody. So looking at those those trades and then looking at the season can already start here in the next 21 days, who do you think is probably going to be the lead favorite this year to repeat in the Nuggets, or you think it's going to be somebody else? No, I, I think you got to go through the team that won the year before first. But I always think in terms of, of uh, dynasties and legacies, Teams that are used to being there will wind up there. You know, the Golden State Warriors, for instance, yeah. I think um, after Denver, I, I'd say, you know, Golden State, because if they're healthy, you cannot discount them. Yeah, know, we're Chris the only reason now, they, they have all seasons is, yeah. And and, and they, uh, they have set the pace for the league. Everybody's playing the game they played. Now, I, what I will say is that I think that what will change league play this year is it the first team that starts playing in the lower post again, where yes. they post up, um, you know, religiously, you know, setting up plays, running them from the, the low post rather than from the high post or the elbow. You know, I think right, that's right. the game, the game will change. Yeah. Denver and possibly Philly with MB and Joker mm -hmm. can do that. Mm -hmm. And I like Joker and, and, better and with that do. situation because he can step out. Yeah. But, and, and, I think they both can step out, but Joker's better at it. Right. You know, because uh, my man in Philly, I I won't lie, because I grew up when they, uh, I was playing in the league when the Cats seven footer started shooting threes. Um, and okay. it was okay with the coaches. Um, but it's it's something that make like I didn't start shooting threes because I felt like I was better at 17, 18 feet. You know, but you were. And you I, killed that. And, and I was. Yeah. Yeah, and I was better getting in the post doing what I was doing. The only reason for me being out the three-point line is it was one of them points in the game where somebody had to shoot it from three, you know. And yeah, one year yeah. I led a, the, the, the team in three-point shooting, but that was never my idea of a big man play. You know, it was just a, another added piece to the game as far as I was sure. concerned. I think, I think they shoot too many of them. I think, it, yeah. you know, to answer your question, um, I think that all of these trades and all of these things that are going on are going to eventually hurt the game, even though the yep. people who say they love it probably never really played it. Um, right. Because most of the guys I talk to, male or female, uh, about the game now, they don't like it. But when they're on camera, they have to say what they have to say. But that's it's not the way we learn the game. And it's not that the game can't change. It's just all change ain't good change. Yeah, you know, that, that, some that, that, some of this true. stuff is, yeah, some of this stuff it it um it has made the players lazy. They would rather shoot a three than post up, drive to the basket. And I think one yep. of the great things about watching uh, a Denver or a Golden State is the style of basketball they played was the style that Don Nelson, Coach Don Nelson, broke into the league in the in the mid early eighties and so right. on. Yeah, he yeah he brought it to the league. He brought it to Milwaukee took it to Dallas, took it to Golden State. All it is is what we call draw and kick basketball. And yep. you take the big yep. man out the low post. If you ain't got a low post guy or guy who can post up and do damage, all you do is get the ball out on the wings or in the middle and you drive to the basket. When the defense collapses, you kick that it to the open that. man. Exactly. Yeah, because that's all, that's all the NBA has become. And it, it's not a rocket science if you set back. That's why it's hard to watch <laughs> because it's too simple. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. too simple just to do this because, you know, in my mind, the way we were taught to play defense uh, by Nelly and um, Milwaukee, Larry Brown, San Antonio, uh, some of the great coaches that I did play for in the league, um, we, were, we would not let you set up and play a two-man game. We go get right. the ball out your hand and them guys that you don't want in the two-man game, you make them beat you. You don't exactly. lose games because you don't have the ability to, to do a simple double team. 
you know, and, mm -hmm. and the fact that you got a lot of young guys that can't remember their roles. And it happens because it, it, it happened to me. Sometimes I'd be in the huddle and the coach would write something down, say, we're going to do this on the pick and roll. I get out there, my mind be blank. I have to go to one of the guys and say, what do you say we going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. Because my mind is going on the whole game. Yeah, you thinking about, right, man, right. I, we, got to, we got to get this rebound. We got to stop these jokers and get to the other end so we can win the game. And here he is writing up some elaborate scheme. And it don't. And, and a lot of times, I'm telling you, I played it in New York with the Knicks. It was three of us. <laughs> that at the time were older than the coach and when oh, the, uh, wow. uh, and so when the coach and we had all us three had this in common we had already at that time all three of us had played at least 15 years in the league and right. um he come in he's trying to reinvent the wheel we in the playoffs were playing my uh miami and uh he he the coach uh Wants to do two a days. It's at the end of the season. We're the oldest team in the two league. Two a days at the end of yeah. the season. Yeah, and and, and oh. their three a days were like Miami, so they were like three hour long. So yeah. um, I'm thinking, okay, you know, you know how old everybody is, right? And, uh, and, and <laughs> I said, so we come in and we do the first practice, and so the second one comes. They call this second one, and I'm thinking, okay, well. It should be a non-contact. Maybe we'll walk through some stuff in Miami. Man, you you know, it's it's a wonder we didn't kill each other because me, Buck, I was on that team with me, Buck Williams, Charles Oakley. And, okay. And, um, the, you, three three of the best power forwards in the league. Uh, yeah, Charlie historic. Ward was a guard on that team, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. one. And um, and he, we in here killing each other. So that second practice, I said, oh, no, nah, I ain't doing this. I took me a ball out the basket and walked all the way down to the other end of the, uh, the, the practice ring and just started shoot free throws. And then he, uh, the coach came over and he said, he said, TC, he said, I know, I know you don't believe in this. I said, no, I don't. I said, because I'm going to let you in on something. I said, every time we play uh, your teams when I wasn't on this team, or played you you all when you were an assistant with uh, the Miami coach, Pat Riley, we banked on the fact that you were going to overwork your guys. That's how we knew we were going to beat you. Because wow. by the time they got to the playoffs, you know, these two a days, three hours a day, three hours uh, a time, them jokers was tired. And or they right. limp into the playoffs because the practices are so hard. I mean, because wow. like I heard, who was it I heard uh, as a young cat? Uh, I think it was Ice. George Gervin, he, he, he told, yeah, he told the coach. He said, "You can either have the, you can have it now, or you can have it when the popcorn popping. You just need right. to decide when you want it. <laughs> when you want, and I, and yeah. I keep the, I keep the butter in. I yeah, keep the butter in. So there's a, there's a such thing as over practicing. <laughs> yeah, because I, I personally think that the reason why so many young guys are injured these days is that mm -hmm. they are overworked. You know, you got all these trainers that have popped up all over the country and all over the world, and they're training cats for professional basketball, taking them through drills that have nothing to do with a basketball court or the psyche yeah, that is really time. necessary to play the game. Because really, just we didn't have all of that stuff. We just we knew the most important thing was to be mentally strong and physically take care of your body and spiritually balance all that stuff out. You know, because now. These cats working out. I, I I remember my middle boy TJ. He played four years at UCLA, and he we were out in the gym one day, and he he was showing me all these moves. He was just shaking and just going through his legs, and and then finally taking a step back. And I said, "Oh, that's cool, but let me show you how to make that simple." I said, "This is how I score. I don't waste a lot of effort. I don't waste a lot of energy." So I took that thing, threw my leg back, stepped back, and popped it. And then I said, "This is all you need right here." You just need a little space Still to get fine. your shot off. Something yeah, you don't you don't have to do all all that other stuff is showing out. And it and right. when you get older, it's like everything else. You ain't got the energy for all that. Just give me the ball. <laughs> and let me just I just need a little space because I can right. shoot this thing. I ain't gotta elevate real high to do it. I just gotta right. you know be be quick about getting it out of my hands, you know. Yeah. But let me um let me jump in here because you and coach can can talk forever about this, but I saw a question in the chat, and it's something I wanted to ask because now 18 years in the NBA, is that correct? Uh-huh. 
uh-huh. 18 years and uh, rookie of the year, a two time all star. And then we we don't have you in the we don't have you in the NBA Hall of Fame. That we needs gonna, to change. We're going right? to put that. We're going to change that. that change, now. Right. Yeah, we, we got that. Yeah. I'm gonna lead your I'm gonna lead your caravan for that. Yeah, I think that <laughs> yeah, I think get, that needs to You're gonna have to get in that caravan with my girl because my girl is uh PO'd about that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 uh, hey, it's gonna be like hey, we're gonna be like Ryan do rolls and tell them to scoot over. <laughs> uh-huh. No, because so, hey, I, I think it's 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 interesting because like um I was really frustrated when I mm. finally retired because, um, and it wasn't just something new. It, I, I managed to stay on top of my game in spite of being frustrated with the the way the game was called and the fact that mm-hmm. no matter what you did, they had already decided who was going to be in the championship and who was going to be their champion because it was right. all about dollars. And, um, right. and I, I know I played on teams good enough to have been at least in a championship. I played in two uh, conference finals and um, won almost, but never in the championship round. And uh, never won a ring, but I never lost a day of sleep over it either because right. I'd come to the conclusion that um, all I can do is put my best effort out every day in every game. And at the end of the game, I go home, I was going home to my family. I wasn't setting up in somebody's club drinking and getting drunk or chasing chicks, you know, because Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, at the end of the day, I'd done everything I could do. And if, and I feel this way about the hall of fame. Um, If my stats alone don't speak for me, there's plenty more stuff. There's the community outreach that I have done for years. And I'm again, not pat myself on the back, but I remember what I did. I work with the Sojourner Truth Home in Milwaukee. It's a home for battered women. I worked for St. PJ's and uh, Sam Shelter. Uh, the, the years I was in San Antonio, these were for youth and uh, single mamas out on the street. And I have always designated charities. Uh, and every year I worked in the league, I'd pick a different one to work with. But I also mm-hmm. always had a heart to, to serve people. And, and that was not to get into the hall because I do that now. And I'll do it even after I'm in the Hall of Fame. Um, but I, I learned this about mankind is that there's, if you can be corrupted, you will be. And you have yeah. to make choices for your happiness. If you, you, you want to be a champion, and that's everything, I will tell you this. It disqualifies you a lot of time from the simplicity of life, which is being able mm-hmm. to live a simple life. Uh, a family life, you know, a secure life because you're, you're, you're in jeopardy when you start to think that things can satisfy you more than, than, you know, real pure love and life itself, you know, without being poetic, you know, but right. it, it, over time, I just learned that, you know, I'm not begging nobody for something that belongs to me, you know, right. and, and if I can't convince nobody but God, then that's all that I'm, I'm cool with that because I got plenty of trophies. I got plenty yeah, of them setting up, and that. all they do is collect. Yeah, dust. they just collect yes, dust. We talked about that. You know, I mean, and and your accolades, all of that, and looking at, you right. know, just what you just mentioned a moment ago about, you know, uh, Val kind of tipped on it all, uh, uh, earlier about the ministry and the serving of the food. Now that you're down in Atlanta uh, and all that, tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the interaction that you got with the homeless or the people that the ministry is feeding and if that program uh, has gotten you to the point that maybe you would expand, have you ever thought about, you know, coming back home to Chicago where you grew up at, you know, on the far South side doing something similar to that? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually closer to that than this conversation because I really know um, Mm -hmm. that um, service to me is, is is like one of the most important things like I, I grew up on that like on the north side of chicago where we lived there was a huge uh presbyterian or baptist church maybe methodist um church and every week or month they would get loads and loads of food and we knew when the time was so we would get this little uh radio flyer like uh wagon them little red wagons with the handles yeah, the and, wagon, and, yeah. yeah and we would pull them down <laughs> pull them down to the church and go down to the church and load up with cereal and all that stuff they had there and bring it home to mom them 
and it it, it helped us and and it it filled a gap because you know mom was having babies all the time and dad was out in the streets so we didn't have a lot of stuff you know it wasn't like you know we could set up uh i mean one of the great things we did do is we we still ate dinner at the table together you know as a family you know but we didn't have we didn't have a lot of anything we but we got what we needed from uh from day to day um that's 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 what i had for you but uh, have you seen oh i'm sorry go ahead val and the question out from our audience, Eric said, did knowing God help you get over some of the disappointments in the NBA? Yeah, because, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. Eric, if um, in my prime, my first 10, 12 years in the league, I was one of the top three or four power forwards in the whole business. And, and in those first 10, 12 years, I averaged on the average somewhere around 20 and, and nine rebounds. So. Uh, right. in, in the height of it, I was in the 23s, 24s, and 10s as far as points and, and rebounds. But it, one of the intriguing things to me is I was used to, um, I, would, I, I didn't win championships on the high school or the college level, but I was used to being treated right. And when I got right. to the league, uh, one of the things I, I found out is uh, my uh, greatest asset was also my greatest liability. And uh, my greatest asset was that I was consistent and, and, and I was uh, faithful and focused and I was loyal. So those, those things that are supposed to be good, you have to make up in your mind that they're good enough for you because the, the, the system wants the bad boy or the bad girl. You know, right. they, they don't necessarily want consistency they talk about it. They're the first to chastise you, but they don't really mm-hmm. want consistency. They they want uh, somebody they can use as a martyr down the road that might shift and and change for them or not, because they don't really care. Uh, basically, and this is not um, something I read in the book. I lived this life, you right. know. And one right. one of my thoughts was, you know, with all of the, um, you know credibility of of my career i only make two all-star teams and um that bothered me not from again an arrogant perspective but because the guys who were chosen in front of me were not better than me you know i never i never felt and then when i was playing on winning teams i don't understand why i can't get into an all-star game and i'm in the elite players you know I'm, i'm one of the few players probably that uh didn't win a championship, but got an MVP vote. And you know, they're hard to come by. But yeah. that speaks to the level mm-hmm. of talent and, and, and credibility you bring, because after a while, it ain't just your talent that uh, impresses people. It's how you carry yourself and how you uh, present yourself to your team and to your community. Because when they feel like they need to hear from someone, the reporters wouldn't go to the young guys. They would come to my locker when they needed to hear the truth. Right, right. Yeah. You know that, that. And did you get a chance? Because at that time in the league, it wasn't many of you guys on the ministry side. But I do remember uh, AC Green with the Lakers mm-hmm. catching a lot of heat. Did you ever have the opportunity to interact with him? And if so, yeah. were you guys, you know, kind of ministry you know, on the same accord? Yeah, yeah. Uh, AC AC got me, man. Uh, and I'm just gonna be real with y'all because this is my personality. I'm. I believe the more transparent you are, the less you have to lie about. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, uh, in ministry, what has made me significant is that um, even to my own hurt, I'll tell the truth, you know, um, because I believe that by doing so, you don't have to lie about things and you don't have to lose sleep over the fact that you lied. Um, I went through uh, a divorce uh, in like my 10th year in the league, I think. And I was about wow. 34, 35. And I'm mm-hmm. telling you emotionally, and I share openly with other dudes and, and other, other women about it because we all have a perception that because we are believers, we ain't gonna mm-hmm. say things that we all not say or do things that we all not do. And, right. uh, and, I, and I'm prefacing it this way because 
we were playing the Lakers, and I, I think I was with Seattle back then. I don't remember. It might have been Milwaukee again. And uh, we were wrestling over rebound. He got the uh, rebound, and um, he threw his elbow, and it, it, it went across my face. And I turned around and looked at him, and, you know, as calm as I am now, um, there's a side of me that is different. And I'm just gonna right. call him different. Uh, I hear right. the cats call him the beast. They call the beast. Right. But that, man, my eyes, my eyes got so big. I ran up and down the court in his ear, just, just yeah, 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 just going in, going in. And I'm talking about I'm in rare form because I ain't even seen this dude here. This dude, I don't even know who he is. He yeah. is cussing with, with he's Jerry frustrated. Curl, with Jerry Curl, no, bro. no, no. He was like this by then. But he okay, but AC then, had yeah. AC AC had the Jerry Curl. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I cussed Jerry at Curl. him. I, I hollered at him. I, I was all up in his ear from one end of the court to the other. We got to the top of the key. He turned around. He said, TC, I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry. And I couldn't wow. say nothing. After all of that, I couldn't say nothing. But I had to get myself together and I had to come back and apologize to him out of wow. respect for what we both stood for. And I apologize. I told him, I said, man, I'm sorry. I said, I'm going through a divorce. It's kind of messed me up a little bit, but I'll be back on point. I apologize to you. I didn't, I shouldn't have went off on you like that. But ordinarily, if I apologize to you, it's because I didn't mean it. But most people right. don't get no apology. You know, if I so, knock you down, I knock you down on purpose. Yeah, I step moving. over you and keep and going. You, yeah, keep it moving, keep it moving. right, right, mm -hmm. right. That is uh, that's incredible. Hey, you guys that listen tonight, we got the great Chicago's own Terry TC comments on air tonight. With of course, to my left, Bowser voice, and you know me, Coach Tony, and lose talk on Tuesday. It's been fire tonight. We just, we just, we just, we just bring you heat out the heat out the heat, and you know. And, and Terry, it's, it's been so, it's, it's been amazing, man, because the the average player in the NBA, whether college or whatever, I don't even think has taken your journey to get to where no. you are. And mm -hmm. here it is, as you just mentioned a moment ago, you know, God has humbled you to the fact yeah. that, that it's taken you through some, some ups, some downs, some highs and some lows. But now that you're at the end of it, you're still reaching out, giving back, and teaching. And you know, you know, how has that been, you know, overall? And you know, from where you came from in that 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 one two one two bedroom apartment to now where life is taking you now in a different part of the country, still doing the same thing, giving back to these people. I was talking to a friend of mine uh today about something right down those lines that you know, it is, uh, I've been asked, you know, why, why are you over in this little corner out here in Conyers with 15, 20 people in the ministry? You know, um, you know, why, why are you over here doing it? Why don't you go somewhere where God can really use you? I said, well, I'm where he told me to be. Now you okay. can go where you want to go, but I'm going to stay him. here till whatever he needs to get out of me and get me in the position to do when I'm ready, he'll let the world know I'm ready. And, and that's right. good enough for me. It ain't got nothing to do with me and my age because age is a time factor. God is an sure. eternal God. So he does exactly. not relate to us in time. He relates to us in what he lives in. He lives in eternity. And whatever we are supposed to do, we will accomplish if we remain constant in what we're called to do. I think right. one of the, the great things for me happened, and we didn't talk about it, but I'm going to share it anyway, is... Uh, my rookie year, I collapsed in a game up in Utah. I'm diagnosed with a arrhythmia. Uh, and, and I come back. I don't know initially that it's arrhythmia, so they put me on iron. I come back, and I'm good three quarters of the game. The fourth quarter, my body wears out. And, and I get into these arrhythmias where I begin to black out. And um, I'm, I wind up at the end of the season at Northwestern Hospital with a Dr. Richard Kehoe, who uh, was a heart specialist. And... Um, they're testing me. Uh, I'm in there for about a week and a half, two weeks, them trying to reinvent that uh, that moment. And you, could, you couldn't because it only happened in a basketball game. And sure. um, so then they told me, um, you can't play anymore. If you do and you have an episode, you're going to probably die. 
And uh, for three months, I, I no str no strenuous activity, no nothing. And um, finally, one day, I just got up and I decided I'm I'm not gonna live my life woulda, coulda, shoulda. So I've I've always lived my life on my terms, other than the terms God set for me. And so um, yeah. I got up one night and just went went out, put sweatsuit on. Oh man, he got that phone call. Yes, yeah, my son calling me, and he he you know, he's he's special. But anyway, uh, so I go out in the park, and in fact, um, they lived in Morgan Park. The girl I was married to, her mom okay. lived in Morgan Park. So I walked up to Ada Park uh, from right. where they lived, and went out in the park and started running. First day a quarter mile, second day a quarter mile, next day half mile, and then so on, so on. I started running so that I ran all the doubt and the fear out of my head, but at the same time, I. I, I took note to the fact that I needed to cover myself. So they put me on an experimental uh, medication and I found a doctor that would um, agree with me that I, I could play and that they, they would monitor me. In fact, I am in part, if not in whole, the reason why they have to have defibrillators behind the benches now. Oh, you wow. know, uh, for players. And so wow. it, it, is, it just so happens that where I was told that I would never play again. If I did, I would fall dead. I wound up just just by my faith and, and, and my own good stubborn. There's some good stubborn and some bad stubborn. The good stubborn came from the bad stubborn. The bad stubborn was just I'm I want it my way. I'm I'm not you're not gonna get me out of this. The good the good the good stubborn was I took that bad stubbornness and I made it work for me in everything, every area I needed it to work for me. Uh, sports, wow. business, fatherhood, you know, brotherhood, everything. It, uh, I will fight with you and I will fight for you. If it's something that you need to get through, you can't get through on your own, I'm with you. If we walk in a relationship, I'm going to fight with you till you get what you need. I'm going to be there for you. I don't want nothing from you. I just want to impart into you that tenacity to overcome whatever it is. Because if you can do it once, you can do it again. You just have Come to constantly on. remind yourself that, you know, God has been good to you. If he brought you through one thing, he can bring you through something else. You know, God is greater than our last experience with him. But I will say this about that whole thing. I played 17 more years after I was told wow. I should never wow. play. I remember and, when that situation happened to you, too. Mm -hmm. and it, I it was, remember it when was, that happened. I was so glad. It was a turning point. And it also... Uh, um, smoothed out the character of my life because I learned then that I could uh, I could get knocked down. Because till then I went through walls. I didn't, you know, I didn't go over them. I didn't go around them. I went through them, you know. And um, I learned I learned that um, I can be stopped. It was a humbling moment uh, for me in my life, and even more humbling um, watching Reggie Lewis die from it. Watching yeah. Hank Gathers Hank Gathers yeah. die from it. Uh, I watched him fall. Yeah, well, I, I, I watched him on the floor of my bedroom, and uh, and I hated that I saw it because I knew the moment I saw it, what he was experiencing, because I experienced it. The only wow. difference is I I got up, you know, and mm -hmm. Hank had two different separate uh, um, exposures of 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 that right. thing with his heart, and the second right. one is the one that killed him. And the second one, I was laying, I was sitting on the floor in my bedroom, and I I said, "Get up, Hank! Get up, man! You got to get up!" And I started crying because, you know, to me that stuff is more real than basketball and fame and all that stuff. Because you know, your body right. is is your opportunity to to impress upon people that that you you are somebody. When that is taken away from you, you don't have any say so in the land where people live or bodies are exposed to life, you know? So um, I've had some some things in my life that rattled me, uh, but I speak the way mm -hmm. I do because I still have life in me. And as long as I do, I have decided that I was gonna be who I'm supposed to be, whether I'm in front of 20 people or 20,000. You know, and I've had the ability and I have the ability. I preach all over the country and all over the world and I speak all over the world and I work in business. I do music, television, film. I act, you know, I write screenplays, my book uh, Unlimited or Limitless. 
Um, I write all this and do all these things because I can, you know, and because life forced me into a place where either I was going to be refined or I was going to be the one they was always talking about um, that didn't get it all done. And most people think because I didn't win a championship that that means I didn't get it all done. I got everything done I was supposed to. I don't That's lose right. sleep over the fact that I, I and I, what I set my mind on didn't fully come come to pass, but I have accomplished more things that benefit more people and benefit God's kingdom. I've accomplished more of those things than I know most of the people will go to the Hall of Fame before me or after me. And it doesn't matter. It's, it's not to compare apples and oranges because the work I right. do, I do out of a service heart. You know, I want to do it. I want to see people's yeah. lives change. And I want people to be strong for what's coming because we got some things coming down the pipeline. I don't care what color you are. We're going to all be one race. We're going to all be one human race and we're going to have the fight of our lives and, and we're going to have to find or have the capacity to, to expand ourselves beyond what we think we know and look into things that we, we have doubts about, but find out the facts about them. Cause you're going to have to deal with some stuff that, you know, in generations past, we just ain't had to deal with it. We're looking at it now with AI technology, right, you know, right. and, and with the, the different genderisms, uh, uh, things that are going on now that are a trouble because they're against what we learn naturally uh, to be true. And this is not something I want to put on y'all because this ain't your show, but it is a priority. <laughs> this is a this is a priority to me because um, it is not to judge them, but it is to make sure that you know what what is the uh, consensus, what is the reality, what is the truth. You know that is where you start. You don't start from your truth; you start from the truth. And if okay. you start from there, you can make better choices and decisions. And in the end, whatever choice or decision a person makes is between them and God. It ain't got nothing to do with the church or preacher or uh, talk host, podcast host. None of us. It don't have nothing to do with us. It's their choice. And it's a choice they have to live with between them and God. And I have accepted that. And I, and I, and I share with people like that. And I have friends who are in that lifestyle, but I don't judge them in their lifestyle. You know, to me, it's about being in position because you're going to eventually get that call and you can't yeah. uh, you can't be anything more than who they expect you to be. Be transparent. You know, this is what I believe, you know, I, mean, I, think, Val, I thought that I was Val. I thought, what I, was thought that? I, I thought I was getting to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Terry, as we wrap up, because I, I really appreciate you, because uh, we usually only go for about an hour or so, but we extended our time just for you. Um, mm. As we wrap Chicago up, what would, be, <laughs> what would be the, I'm assuming, advice you would give to, uh, number one, young players that are interested in the game of basketball, and then people that are also playing a sport, they're playing something and they have a, a faith walk with God, what would you, how would, how would you advise them? There's, there's a scripture that says that if you are to have faith, have it unto yourself. Mm -hmm. One of the first things you have to learn as a student, student athlete or professional athlete is that your faith is a faith between you and God. It has nothing to do right. with your team that you play for, your teammates, uh, your mom, your dad, it is an individual, personal thing. So if you decide this is the route you're going, have faith in God. Believe God for yourself. Don't take home your mama and your dad is God or your big brother and big city's God, your big sister's God. Learn who God is to you and then put that to work in, in your life. Because um, this is not about being religious. Religious is, is a concept of systematic or systems that are put in right. place whereby it's easier to be in a system because the system is set. And so you know right. what to expect in a system, but what you, where you don't know what to expect is when you create relationship with God, you don't have an expectation that, that can exceed him because he's too big. You know, he, he's too great in his infallibleness, his, his infiniteness. He's, 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 I mean, and he's real. I, I've had reporters, and people come up to me over the years and say, man, you talk about God like he's real. I said, he is. 
He ain't a fig. He ain't a figment of my imagination. <laughs> you know, he, he ain't. He, yeah, he ain't Casper the Friendly Ghost. He, you know, he is real. He's real to me. And and I not preface it by saying to them, uh, uh, the the God I serve is not blonde haired, blue eyed, and white. He ain't curly haired, dark skinned, and black either. You know, the scripture says that God is a spirit, and we who worship Him. We worship him in the spirit of truth or in spirit and in truth. And you cannot, uh, to, to, to uh, end the question you, you gave out, you cannot consequen consequentially uh, involve yourself in anything where you don't, uh, where God and Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh, Jehovah, whoever you want to call him, where he is involved, you cannot involve him absent the truth that is what makes everything balanced but if you don't accept the truth then what you've accepted is a truth that is okay. lesser than the truth you know because it's yours normally but that's what i would tell them get your get your own relationship with god <laughs> and, and ursula ursula here ursula here said she threw her shoe at the screen i don't know what to <laughs> is, it, is, it, is that what i heard go crash Crash, you know, again, hey, Terry, this is why we had to have you on this show. Besides being home love, man, home cooking, man, this is what we've been doing. And God has, you know, brought me to Val, you know, right mm -hmm. at two years ago and doing some things. And the show has been phenomenal. And now we like now we like thick and thin or mud and gel, however you want to put it down. We like blue lines on a white paper. But you know, <laughs> it's been great to move. And because of the opportunity of working with Val, there's been other things that I've been looking at trying to do has blossomed and opened up because of some things that you just said, you know, slowing mm -hmm. down on other things and to open other things up. So man, yeah, first of all, I'm gonna definitely be in touch with you. And I appreciate your time, honesty tonight, and just more importantly, just again, you know, laying the truth out to our audience. And man, we just appreciate you, man. One love. No, I, I appreciate y'all having me on. And if y'all, I know it's time to go, but can I pray? Sure, of let's course. Do that. I, I, won't, I won't give you. I won't give you the uh, the long Baptist version or the uh, the longer well, Pentecostal hey, version. Hey, 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 man. He started, he started, he started hitting them voices. I'm about to say, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I Father, am I down just, for it. Let's go. Yeah. Father, I just want to thank you for this time of fellowship with my sister Val and, and, and my brother Tony. And I pray, God, as you have invested so much into them to get them to this place and this point, you've drawn them out of many places to be together on this platform. I'm asking God, God that you would bless them and increase them and that you would give them the fondness for your spirit and your truth and that you would cause, Lord God, the, the eventuality of the vision you've given to them to not only explode and expand, but to come to pass in this, their lifetime. And that you would cause, Lord, them to be not fortunate, but blessed in everything that they're lacking. I'm asking God that you would fulfill their needs. You would cause even the brokenness in their lives, Lord God, to be healed and mended so they can be whole and complete when they bring their message, whatever that message is. And I pray that whatever that message is, you are at the center of it. And I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And my brother, man, amen. I appreciate you. Hey, you are yeah. always anytime, T. Welcome on this show, man. We're gonna we're gonna definitely have you back because I want to hear some 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 as I can tell <laughs> Val here, T. T. For promotional purposes only, I do give out a couple of <laughs> couple of good games. Uh, the only thing I think we need to do right now, we gotta have Jesus come down and bless Soldier Field because I don't know what's going on with our bears, man. But that's a whole yeah. other story. Well, that's you don't have to story. talk about that because I'm a bet. You know, when you are Chicago for real, you are you are a Chicago fan of their proteins, whether they win or lose. Exactly. And I'm telling exactly. you, man, it's hard to watch it's them hurtful. right now because they, so yeah, they, they got, got pieces. Yeah, they got pieces. Yeah, but they they just they and, and a lot of times it just take one thing and it may be that we need to pray for them. Hey, T, and my guys will tell you, <laughs> my basketball team, my family, my son, 
Hey, I'm ride or die. I'm ride or die, shy. You know, I don't care what uh -huh. it is. They ask me that. That's it. I, I'm not Same that fair woman. Now, you know, I'm gonna write, even though I'm gonna bump with the Cubs and party with them, I'm still gonna support them. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. but we start all day every day. But you know, again, my brother, we will be in touch. I will be in Atlanta pretty soon, so we don't do nothing but catch up, do the lunch, dinner, chop it up. I'm gonna let you know if I hear it that way. Well, I'm I'm also doing some. I'm uh I'm doing a launch pretty soon. I got another album. I've got four out already. I'm getting ready to do Ooh. another one. And I do uh, love and romance. So my stuff is more in the style of R&B um, because I believe that we need some stuff, even as believers, that's clean and pure, you know, and yeah, the music. Exactly. But the music has to be standard wise, you know, to the standard of what we we love. You know, those of us our age, we love a lot of music, but we grew up with R&B and soul. And um, sure. so I do a lot of this. Not my singing voice. It's uh, uh, my range is uh, Gerald Levert to uh Brian McKnight, so yeah, okay. um, I do a lot of a lot of that. But I, when I when I finish mixing this new project called uh, "Love Is a Journey," um, I want to come and break it out on here. I really feel this. Yeah, yeah, cool to break it out right right here on the yeah. show, but with, and you know, Val and me and Val are big time house music. You know, back in the day, Chicago, we house music. So yeah. and I and I just started and I just started a show it's called the after show with Val the voice and we would love to have you on because all we do is vibe with music a lot of the people that listen and that are fans they 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 are here watching and cheering you on but TC Cummings Terry thank you so much for joining us I'm going to just Thanks close out the me. show coach thank you so much for being here guys this is talk on Tuesdays we'll be back next week Peace. Peace. <laughs>